to start things off, how has rehearsal been going so far? It's really fast and furious. We've had two rehearsals so far. I've never been in a contract that's this quick. It's a little terrifying, but it's been great. It's been fun. It's certainly been a learning experience and just doing it as fast as possible. I usually like to take my time, so this is, this has really been a good lesson and skipping the luxury of analyzing every moment of just sort of jumping in and doing it. It's been fun. Tell us about your character in Wit. I play Susie Monahan, the primary nurse for Vivian Baring, who is uh, the cancer patient. She's sort of the heart of the play. Well, she's certainly the first one to show any sort of compassion or, or warmth toward Vivian. You know, Vivian's an academic, and she's extremely smart, and she is being treated by these researchers who don't have very good bedside manners. You know, I serve as her sort of emotional outlet. I'm the one that she is able to be vulnerable with, which is something that I think Vivian is not used to in life, let alone in this situation of being sick. She's a nurse who knows a lot more about the patient than the doctors tend to do, and is good at dealing with the patient as a human being rather than as a specimen. So how do you approach the role? I thought a lot about the nurses that I've known in my life, the experience I've had with nurses. I watched some documentary stuff about cancer treatments and palliative care. As with anything, I look at what I want from the scene and how to get it. I tend to think that, you know, the approach to any character is, is the same. It's as long as you're just trying to figure out what the objective of the scene is and how you're going to get it. Obviously, there are many different tactics in one scene, but it's all about trying to figure out how to get what you want in that particular scene. You, of course, have been acting since you were a kid. What was your inspiration to want to become a performer? My father had been an actor in the 60s, and he had quit. Then when I was about seven or eight, did a show just sort of on a whim for some friends. It was a semi-professional production, and I went to see it, and it's my first memory of seeing any theater at all, except for, like, you know, puppet shows as a kid. And I had been terribly bullied in school, so I recognized acting as an opportunity to not be myself for as long as I could be on stage, and that was extremely appealing. So I asked my parents if I could try it, and they were very hesitant. They, you know, they had sort of bad images in their head of child actors, but I think they thought that I would do some community stuff and get it out of my system, which was not the case. That's how that started. Yeah, at a young age, you were able to make your Broadway debut. Now tell us about your experiences of doing Les Mis. I was in it for over a year. I was the first girl in the company to cover the role of Gavroche, because I had short hair from the previous show I had done, and that was actually the role I really wanted to play, because that was the one that really had the meat in it. I was fortunate in that I didn't have any experience with major theater, with Broadway, certainly, so I didn't know enough to be, like, scared or nervous, and also just wasn't trained at all. So, it, for me, it was just like another experience. Shortly before then, I had been playing Low League on Saturday mornings. Now I was doing this. It was just another thing that I was doing. It was great because the community that is the cast was so different from what I knew, you know, going to school. That it was just a wonderful change, and I saw how people could be realized, you know, I found my people. You know, I guess in retrospect, I, I was learning a lot about stagecraft and a lot about being professional on the job, which I'm lucky to, you know, be able to say I did. And I'm still friends with a lot of the people that I was in that company with, and that was, God, 27 years ago. Of course, theater fans best know you from your Tony Award-winning performance as Mary Lennox in The Secret Garden. Would you mind sharing us your experience with that show? It was my favorite book growing up. My mother had introduced it to me when I was young, and I had read it many, many times before the show came about. I used to act it out in my bedroom all the time and imagine that I was Mary Lennox in this big dark house. I understood the character and people have always said about me when I was young that I was an old soul and I think Mary is not a normal kid, you know, she's not a happy-go-lucky, she's not Annie, she's not Matilda, she doesn't know how to be around people. She's had a rough go of it. 
and for whatever reason, I was able to sort of key into that. Again, it was another experience of like learning how to be an actor while being paid to be a professional actor. So in some ways it was a crash course, but it wasn't scary or anything. It just felt like, again, it felt like this is the thing that I'm doing. Again, the cast was so incredibly loving and supportive that it, it never felt like work to me. It just felt like fun. It felt like sort of a salvation from the rest of my life. My mother was ill. She was diagnosed for like the last six months that I was in the show, and that was pretty challenging. So I was, I was very, very fortunate to have that show during that period in my life because I had this wonderful cast of people around me to support me, and I also had this sort of make-believe world to escape into for two and a half hours a night. Put my head somewhere else that wasn't in my mom's illness. It was a whirlwind, and it was thrilling, and I had no experience before then with the Tony Awards. I'd never watched them. just weren't a part of my growing up, so it was all very fast and thrilling. We didn't have Instagram back then, so a lot of the memories, unfortunately, somebody told me that I met Robert Redford. I just completely forgot that. If I had Instagram or Broadway World back then, then I'd have all these memories recorded, but it was before that. It was a time when things happened in the moment, and then they were gone. From having seen your speech on YouTube, Audrey Hepburn presented you the award, and you were up against your co-star Alison Frazier, LaChance, and Katie Huffman. You were announced the winner, and of course, you most notably thanked your agent, Francis Del Duca. My mom was adamant that I wasn't going to win because kids don't win Tonys, and she didn't want me to be, you know, heartbroken. So she was saying, they don't give Tonys to kids. Be prepared for that. And then just in case, we wrote these names down on a piece of paper, thank God, because I would have gone blank. I would not have remembered a single thing up there had I not had that piece of paper. It was like, of course I was going to thank my agent. Yeah. He got me the role. It, it didn't occur to any of us that that was, like, funny or cute or anything. It just was a sincere, you know, hey, thanks for being a part of this. You know, you, of course, that night became the youngest actress to have ever won a Tony, a second youngest overall, the youngest being, the, of course, recently deceased Frankie yeah. Michaels from the original production of Maine. Now, how does it feel to still have that record? It's lovely. I mean, I've gone through some rough times in my life, and there have been times where I've been able to just sort of hold on to that and think, like, all right, well, at least I can say that, like, in all of the universe, I have this one thing that makes me completely stand out and unique from the billions of people on the planet. And that's sometimes comforting and sometimes daunting. And I will admit that, like, when Sydney Lucas was nominated, there was a, a part of me that was like, oh, I might, oh, wait, no, she still would have been older. Yeah, I Googled that. Uh, you know, and, and there are lots and lots of shows now with kids in them and little girl from Tuck Everlasting. My, my father, who hasn't seen it, said, oh, my God, how old is she? Are we going to have a problem? It was a joke. And she is younger than I was. I mean, I would imagine she'd be, well, I don't know. It's a very tough year. You've got Hamilton, and you've got Audra, and anytime you've got Audra on the docket, your chances decrease. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day. Even if a nine-year-old comes along and wins, I'm still going to have a Tony Award. It always means something to me. And you, of course, also recently got to be a part of the 25th anniversary concert at Lincoln Center a couple months ago. I did. It was what was that like? And of course, Mary Lennox was played by Sidney Lucas. It was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. When I heard about the concert, the first time I'd heard about it was when they announced that Sidney had been cast. And the first thing I did was call my agent and say, I have to play Martha. I have to play Martha. For some reason, we were having trouble. I don't know why, but we were having trouble getting through to them. And I don't know if that was just whatever. I just knew that I had to play that role. I basically, long story short, told Marsha and Lucy that I wanted to play the role. And the next day, they offered it to me. I mean, it was one of those moments where I thought my agent was punking me, you know? Like, I was like, what? Is that, I mean, that worked? And, of course, then the panic set in. I was like, oh, my God, can I do this? What have I got myself into? And I just trained, and I made sure that I was ready. You know, and everyone kept saying, like, oh, it's going to be so crazy. It's going to be so weird for you to be up on that stage and the other role. And I, I was prepared for it to be really weird and crazy, and it wasn't. It just felt like I was playing that role. And then when I walked on for the first performance and I said, well, there, Mary Lennox, they, you know, the audience went crazy because that moment was sort of me greeting myself. It was, it was the older me sort of greeting my younger self. And also I think in some ways people felt like it was me being like, all right, let's see what you got, Sydney, <laughs> which of course was not the case. Sydney was tremendous in 
that role. She was so terrific and very different from me, which I think is sort of the beauty of theater. I felt like I, in some ways, got to like sing to my inner child, and I got to sort of close a chapter that that needed to be closed, and I got to sort of make peace with a lot of things from that era in my life. You know, I got to sort of give myself a hug and tell myself life is going to turn out okay. And I think that, like, to go down deep, I think psychologically it was a big turning point for me just as a person. So I, I cannot express how eternally grateful I am that I got to do that. The cast was incredible. and I would watch people and listen to people and just think, like, I cannot believe that I'm here. I cannot believe that I'm lucky enough to be here. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful thing. We're lucky enough to live long enough to be able to do that and to be in a profession that lets us do that. Who else gets to do that? Is there any advice you'd like? Like to give to any aspiring young performers out there? Sure, there's lots of advice. I think the main number one thing to remember at all times throughout your entire career is that it has to be fun. I mean, there are going to be times in the slog of it and the business of it that aren't going to be fun. That's just the way it is. Endless rejection is, is not fun. And batting average is always going to be low. It just is unless you're Potter McDonald's. You audition for 20 things and you get one of them. And it's, that's the way it is for everybody. And so every audition is a gift and it's an opportunity to learn a new skill or try something that you've been hoping to try or just exercise your craft. When you get the job, if, it's not, if you're not having fun, then you need to really look at why you're doing it and if it's worth it. Some jobs aren't fun. Some jobs you'll work with a director that you can't stand, but just as you you know, for yourself when you're performing, or if you feel overall like, ugh, this just isn't fun anymore, then it is time to really reconsider, because there's no reason to do this if it doesn't bring you joy and happiness. There's no reason. There's no reason to do it. The chances of you becoming rich off of being an actor are so slim that it's important that you love it and be happy with it. And my other piece of advice is to always be training, whatever that might mean to you. It doesn't mean be polished. A lot of kids, especially, their parents have them in 7,500 million lessons. And I don't really think that's appropriate or healthy. But I think, you know, always be vocalizing or always be reading plays, reading monologues and going to see plays. And that's really important. And, and reading about factors, too. You know, reading memoirs and autobiographies is, is fun. And also, it's very, very important logistically and just for your soul to have other things in your life that you like to do. And I'm not saying, like, you need a fallback career. I'm just saying you need to be a well-rounded person. And when you walk into that audition room, if you are an automaton actor, they're not going to want to work with you. But if you're a person who has interests and knows about interesting things and has a sense of humor and can carry a conversation, then you're going to go a lot farther because that's somebody that people want to spend six weeks in a room with or, you know, five years on stage with. So have other interests. Learn about monarch butterflies or black holes or tax law. I don't know. Just learn about anything else that is interesting to you. And, and also you just never know how those things are going to inform your craft. Mm -hmm. You just never know. Daisy, I thank you very much for devoting your time to this interview, and I wish you all the best of luck with WIT. Thank you so much.